All right, hello, and have a very really good morning. How's it going, everyone? So today is a little bit of a different stream for the simple reason that we're, uh, for once again, doing a programming stream or, um, well, something close to one, I guess, because what we're really going to do is we are going to look inside a game, a classic game, and we're going to do that for the simple reason that I don't really need to have many skills in the matter of reverse engineering or whatever, because this game was made with a scripting language, which in turn means that... Um, it's basically all plain text. There is nothing nothing to disassemble from machine language back into something readable. It's just all readable text the way they shipped it originally. And this game is the game Myst. A classic um, first-person puzzle adventure. From uh, 1993 is, I think, when I looked it up last time. Um, so a little bit of history. Myst was made using a program called HyperCard. And HyperCard has a scripting language called HyperTalk. So um, how would you find out about that? Um, well, you've... You might have heard about it um, at the time. And if you haven't, then you might be a curious person. So, so what you see here on screen is an emulator of a classic Mac OS computer. So we're running Mac OS 9 in emulation here. Um, 9.04 to be precise. I've emulated 256 megabyte, which would have... I'm not even sure if any Mac ever shipped able to have 256 megabytes. And yes, that's not a typo. It's really megabyte. It's not gigabyte. Um, and um, we're emulating a PowerPC, so a RISC-based old Mac. Um, but definitely, even if there were Macs with 256 megabytes at the time, uh, it would have made you quite poor to buy one. Um, what we also have is I've installed a little bit of software that many people would have had. For one, I've installed Code Warrior, which we'll not need. I've installed a PDF viewer. Um, and also, I've installed some of Apple's own software, including this little program, ResEdit. And a ResEdit is kind of... It was a developer tool, so usually as a software developer, um, you would have used it to install... Um, uh, to create dialog windows in your programs and things. So... I actually have a few programs here. Let's look at that. That's an example application. And it comes with a resource file, ResEdit. It's the same little Jack in a box or Mac in a box, I guess is what you would say. And if you open that, you get something like this. It's a tiny little window, and it looks like it's a whole bunch of files inside our file. And that's basically the main uh, unique thing about classic Mac OS at the time. They actually had two parts of a file. So every file could contain just the regular file contents. So for a text file, uh, you know, the text and they could also contain these resources. Um, and for example, there are your mouse arrows in there, like they actually have a little 
uh, like this test application has like a white mouse arrow as well and a mouse arrow with a spinning beach ball to indicate progress but you can still use the mouse you have progress cursor to tell you well you can't do anything while this is working they also have the stopwatch they have a lot of progress cursors in this example uh, this is an example application for learning programming basically and you have dialogues which are basically you know window definitions and you see here so it has a little preview of like the different boxes you can see your text fields things like that and you can double click that to actually edit them so this gray rectangle is for the group boxes around these check boxes and things um so that's basically what you would normally have used res edit for it also contains you know a little drawing application with which you could paint your icons um lots of stuff like that you can put little pictures in there like here they made their about screen a fun little picture um and of course you can put localizable text in there um and you can put your menu bar in there with like all the menus um so this is um uh what you did uh usually when you were a teenager like me at the time and um you know just wanted to know how stuff worked what you did was you grabbed the application say mist and dragged it onto res edit um and now you see a whole bunch of icons you see here they have a hand cursor and that already looked a little familiar to me um and you have some color cursors that they designed those are mostly new um this hand cursor kind of looks like the other one, just without a shadow and in color. Okay. And so you just can, or you could extract sound files and icons, if I remember correctly. My Mac was so tricked out. Yes, yes, definitely. I'm trying to see. This one doesn't have sound files. Well, just since we'll need it for comparison anyway, um, I think think yeah I have hypercard here so let's open up hypercard with res edit and compare it to mist you see mist already contains a whole bunch less but that's basically because they pared it down to fit more images on the disk um, for one but you see a few things are similar so you see there are this XCMD and XFCN. That stands for external command and external function. Um, but yeah, uh, why I wanted to open HyperCard is because HyperCard has sounds in it. So it actually had a harpsichord and you could say sound here. Try sound. Uh, I don't think you could hear that. Let me check. I'm actually running this emulation on Windows, as, as you see. Yeah, of course, I've set the wrong speakers. So let's see if we now hear something. Um, where are my sounds? Here. That actually worked, although it was twice since I turned on my speakers. Okay, so that, uh, for example, then we can... The boing. The sounds sound a little off because HyperGuard did something special, so like this boing is a lot higher pitched. Um, but since you could play with melodies with HyperCard, you could kind of use it there. Um, and, and could say, you know, play something at pitch C and it would pitch the sound down or up. So basically it kind of normalized it sounds I don't really know all hypercard sounds basically sound wrong when played in res edit it has been like that since I can remember and it has dial tones they're very short they play 
they're also like they use some features that most programs never used in sounds uh for example you could define sounds so they had like a start like an onset a actual looped portion that gets used uh as long you know as the sound is playing and then uh uh what do you call it end um for lack of a better word so almost like midi sounds like uh there was a lot of stuff in there already and so this one is very short but actually when you play it it goes do like a flute and not just do um anyway so yeah that's the kind of stuff you could find there you can even just find big plain text in there um but anyway so what you did as a kid, probably as a user of Hypercard, was at some point you pointed res edit at it and saw, okay, those are the menus that Hypercard has. Um, it has this font, so like you could actually put text files, uh, text fonts uh, into here, and you see, oh, okay, that's not really a font. The A is a lock icon. The B is a hand icon, the C is a button icon. So they put some small icons in here instead of bitmap text. Um, all right. Um, and I mean, you may see some of these icons later, like this one. Um, this is not the actual cursor. Um, and it has a few typical dialog windows. You see a croak error confirm, edit report rec record, icon editor, card size, font size, like some of those names, answer folder, answer folder seven, preview, save a copy, new stack. So you'll kind of, it, it has some named resources so mini files so to say um in there and it has a window border window definition function um in their windowed movable modal borderless so you see something like this so let's look at mist mist has windowed and movable modal as well Interestingly, it doesn't have borderless, which confuses me to no end because I thought they actually used borderless, but maybe they modified something. I don't know. Um, then you see this WTLK, string symbol cells arcs. That's actually a custom resource. I think that was, yeah, that's used for the programming language. So if you look at do, else, and exit function. So there are a lot of um, weird um, things that already read like they're hypercard related because it has that here as well. So you can kind of guess, okay, yeah, that's definitely, they took hypercard and deleted some stuff out. And maybe it's an older version. Like you see here, it has XCMD and it has lowercase XCMD. And lowercase XCMD is basically the version for PowerPC computers. And uppercase XCMD is the version for um, 68,000 computers. So back then, Apple... Uh, was just about to switch like when mist come out uh, apple came out apple was just about to switch um from the old 68000 computers uh, uh, cpus like the atari st and the amiga also used them at the time to uh risk power pc cpus so i think we can close that and we can see Mist is definitely a copy of Hypercard in some way. It contains a lots, lot of things that you might know from there. 
Um, it also contains the same little font as you see as HyperCard. That's probably a good giveaway, all these little icons that it oddly stored in a font are in there as well. Um, but really they exchange. Oh, this picture is actually one that you see in a HyperCard as well. And if you look at our dialogues, you see croak, error, all in there. There none of the seven dialogues that said something was seven, like answer file seven, um, were in there. The seven in there was because at the time Mac OS seven or System Seven as it was just called at the time had just been released. Um, or, or was still fairly new. And so software needed to run on System 6 and System 7. And so sometimes they had the new stack window and they had the new stack window for System 7, which was slightly different to be used with System 7 specific API or something like that. Um, so yeah, we now definitely know, yes, as everyone says, Mist was apparently made with HyperCard. Um, first thing to confirm. So uh, what else do we want to do? Well, um, so I told you about external command and external function, um, which were code resources, which means they were little bits of native code that someone wrote with a real C or Pascal compiler, like the Code Warrior I pointed at earlier that I have also installed. Good morning, Tony. Um, and so um, these code resources were how you could extend HyperCard. So HyperCard came with a few of them. And if you look in here, you see four picture. These, this one with the one digit number, that's basically one that came with HyperCard. Movie is also one that came with HyperCard. I think that is usually number seven. Um, but they changed it. Um, and so that's why they changed its number. So they could more easily swap it out, I guess. And then these are all, like, it's a slight change. You'll see later why. Um, and then they added a whole bunch of third-party extensions. The most important one of these is probably Hypertint, which we will get into later. Also the whole decurse and move cursor. HyperCard only had black and white mouse pointers. Myst obviously has colored ones. So of course they needed an extension to show those. Um, but yeah, so these native code plugins are there. We can actually open these and see them in disassembly if we wanted to. This is, by the, by the way, for those of you who used classic Mac OS and RIS Edit, you might be used to this um, looking more like this. Just a hexadecimal display with like plain text in one column, hexadecimal in the other and the offsets here. Um, but um, the fun thing is this code editor actually comes from Apple. You can see it here. You actually get res edit co code viewer copyright Apple computer when you click on that mouse on that Apple logo. Um, so it's not morning sillies. Hi, your mama. How's it going? <laughs> it is morning where I am, and if you want to eat pa pancakes, it can be morning for you, and you, and you, and it can even be morning for this guy. I am different. Um. <laughs> All right. Um. So this editor actually came with ResEdit and was an optional installation. Um, no, no one is in mourning. Okay. That, that, well, 
the turret. The turret is in mourning because in the pro process of playing Portal, I had to topple over some of his friends. Are you really there? I really need to I really need to dust that one off more often. It just sits in his in his box in the shelf. <laughs> well, not box like in a like it's a square shelf spot. <laughs> All right. Um so yeah, this code editor, if you look here, you see when you got ResEdit, it actually came with a ResEdit extensions folder. And that was a KCS numrig editor. That's a, um, like, four icons that were used for keyboard layouts. And there is a code editor, and that's the one you're seeing here. And basically, to install that, you just open this file copied these resources and pasted them into ResEdit. Or if you were a little more careful, um, you could also put it in ResEdit's preferences files. Um, and that's what I did, because then that means to get rid of any bad editor that you've installed, you just delete the preferences file. Because ResEdit just opened the preference file and all the resources inside it would be used as well. And what I could actually do, let's do that for a moment to be able to, uh, ah, you see, it still remembers I was there. So, um, wait, where is it? Press edit preferences. So you see there is a bunch of stuff from the code editor in there. Um, there are also these TMPL resources that kind of describe the format of a resource. You remember I was there? When was I where? Um, <laughs> not sure your mama what you mean right now. And uh, there are these, so, so these template TMPL resources where you could describe the format of a resource. So for example, you see here, it says like the first is a decimal word. So that's a two byte integer. Decimal byte is a one byte integer. Um, rect is a rectangle, um, which I think means this template will not work in ResEdit. Because as far as I remember, oh no, Rect actually was in ResEdit as well. There was a second resource editor called Resourcer. Um, you said it remembered you were there. Oh, okay, yeah, the, the open dialogue, <laughs> right, okay, gotcha now. And you remember I was there, okay, thank you. It's nice to be, to be remembered. Anyway. Um, and this is a decimal long, so just a four byte integer, and, and you can give them a title. And so using these four letter types, you could kind of describe the format of a resource. And then if you create a new resource, um, so I can do that here, ILRP was I think what this was called, whatever that means, I don't even know what type that is. It will actually open it and show it in like as a list of labels and text fields. So it's not super pretty, but it was nicer as seeing it only in this hex view. Ah, okay, here it says code editor preferences. I guess that's ILRP. So auto load traps as button search for all references. So you can actually directly view and edit the preferences here. Too bad it was commercial, so I could never afford resource error. Um, yeah, Tony, at the time, I remember as well, it was, I, I used the demo they had a little bit, but yeah, um, and I actually have the manual back there, uh, in a, in the, on the shelf. Um, the resource error one zero manual. 
Come on, I'll be right back. If we're gonna yap on about mist and old software. Somehow the green screen is moving today. Um, of course the lighting... Ah, no. Resource or a... A resource editor for Macintosh computers, version 1.0, by Mathematics. And that these people like their mathematics, you can tell from the fact that um, that they had a formula on their website to calculate the price for each version. So they kind of went like major version number times minor version number, some formula. And if you calculated that, you could tell what this version would cost. And I think the last uh, version of Resourcer that shipped was $256. Um, yeah. And I mean, it's a nice little manual. Let's see if I can... Yes, there is a nice little screenshot of how the resourcer windows looked. I don't know if you can actually see any... Oh, wait. Um, here, this will probably be a little better to see for you. Like, basically, they, they all had this little gray border, and they had um, the very characteristic thing. I can't point at it right now, but on the other side over there, um, you see that there is the scroll bar, and below the scroll bar is that little box with the two squares, and that's an old System 7-style resize box that usually was in the window corner. But Resourcerer had this special thing where the resize box was, was always on each list in the window. Which is actually a pretty clever feature. Because it means if you had two lists in the window, you could tell Resourcerer which way, like which of them you wanted to... Um, you wanted to resize when resizing the window. So it did just make the bottom most larger and then you had to drag down a separator or anything like that. Anyway, so you see we get... Oh no, right, I've already done this. Um, I just wanted to... I, I just tricked myself. So anyway, and in the res edit preferences there are also these so, so there are these templates with which you can des describe the format of a resource. And there are R maps. And R maps, you see here, there is one for XCMD. And if you look in that, it says map to code. So that means whatever editor is set for code resources should be used for XCMD resources as well. And that's why, despite XCMDs being special for HyperCard, um, I can open it and it gets shown disassembled like any other source code. Um, so that's just a reset feature. Anyway, but yeah, most of you will probably have this resedit extensions folder and we'll have the code editor. You just need to install it by copying it into the uh, preferences file. You're welcome. <laughs> if you if you have an old Macintosh or an install, um, in an uh, not an install, an emulator. Anyway, so now we know that Mist is basically HyperCard, and uh, 
there is a second puzzle piece. Um, and, and so we know it contains a lot of resources, among others, hypertint. And um, so we know that we can look at all that stuff. Um, so now one more thing about Mac applications. You can say get info for mist. This kind of shows you the low level file attributes. So you see like created, modified, date and time. Um, the size you see there is, what is it? 793 kilobytes in the resource fork and 43 kilobytes in the data fork. Okay, that sounds interesting. Um, and it has these type and creator. Um, and so these were kind of like the old Macs that cost a lot of doll hairs. Yeah, yeah. 256 doll hairs. Remember, you know, like imagine having to pick them all off your doll to pay. No. Um, all right. And so um, basically the type is kind of like a file extension today. So Mac OS didn't put any any importance on like dot rsrc like here uh this thing that i showed you earlier project settings dot h uh test soup application cpp test soup application dot h those extensions don't tell mac os anything those are all just plain text files because if you edit them with uh, ResEdit, or I actually have a dedicated application here called uh, File Typer. Um, so if I draw project settings.h onto File Typer, you see that its file type is TEXT. Its creator is CWIE, which is Code Warrior. Um, <laughs> so yeah. Um, so you can see, um, that, um, uh, that mist, uh, had the type APPL, which is an application. So on modern Mac OS, that would be dot app app, um, and on Windows, that would be roughly equivalent to .exe, so an executable .exe. Um, but macOS also had this creator type, which is basically an owner. So an application has a certain creator, which in this case is mist. Luckily, that was four letters long, so it could be used for this four-letter code. Um, and then you could go and say, okay, if I have files, then, uh, so look here, missed files. You see they have a little icon with this little book in it, but it's a document. So if I, uh, where did my res edit go? I think I closed, oh, no, wait, I have res edit down here. So let's just drag it here so we have that open. Um, so we can say get info for the channel wood age and you see it also says mist. And so when you double click, double clicked channel wood age, it would know to start mist because mist is the applications on this computer with the creator code mist. So that is how classic Mac OS knew what, uh, file to open. Do you remember the DF editor extension for ResEdit that allows showing data fork in ResEdit? I actually, I didn't remember that that was a thing. I know Resourcerer did that. Resourcerer showed the data fork as an extra, as its own entry, um, as its own pseudo resource. But um, I actually don't remember that that existed. 
you know what? Let's let's quickly see if I can do something because that would be really helpful for the rest here. Uh, I did. Uh, wait. Um, let's see if maybe that's available online. Let's see. Um, I don't think it is available anywhere. Yeah. Oh, but I can do the second best thing. Yeah, I should have thought about that and prepared it. But uh, we might be able to do a quick install because I do have some, yeah, here it is, other. Uh, so here's the thing, um, ResEdit only shows resources, but it would be useful to also see data forks. Um, uh, wrong button. Um, here. Um, yeah, Gigabyte is the right folder. All right, so now we have hex edit here, which is a editor that will show us at least a hex editor wait view for a file. So I have created a hypercard stack ages ago here. It's called color test. So let's open that in hex edit. And you see it has STA key, a K you can read in here. It has some scripts that look like on open card, send color me to this card, pass open card. So like end close stack and open stack and yeah and open card yeah things like that um there is a block named list and pay so, so you see like they've kind of simulated their own version of a resource file in a little bit that's something i know because i'm familiar with it but like if you've ever looked at a hypercard stack you will see that all the scripts are in plain text in this file. They're not compiled in any way or so. And you see a lot of BKGD that reads like background, which is a concept in HyperCard. Um, there is CARD card and STAK, which is stack. So you can recognize some things. And at the end, there is tail. And then it says, that's in, in, in Swedish, if you opened uh, a stack with simple text, so the, the text editor, um, it would actually here show a, uh, a Swedish A. So, nu er slut, I think is what it's called. This is the end. Um, I think it's from a TV show. Um, but anyway, you wish you could remember where you got it. It's many years since you used that extension. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> nice. Oh, your mama is enjoying the gameplay. <laughs> there are, I'm, I'm sorry to say there will probably not be much gameplay today. Anyway, so this is how a normal stack looks. And now if we go in this mist folder and you see here, if you've played mist, you know that there is mist island 
and from there you can go to different different places which are referred to in game as ages and so there is the selenitic age the stone ship age the mechanical age the dunny age and the channel wood age and so let's just open the stone ship age with res edit and you see again it starts with s t a k like stack um it has here on open stack blah 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 um so you can see all the code here already um so it has all the same elements b k g d it's just a good chunk larger and in the end it has the tail that says no loot so um you can actually see that um this is just a hypercard stack and uh, one thing that hypercard let you do is you could open a stack and you could say save a copy and you could say instead of saving it as a stack you could save it as its own self-contained application um and if you do that, you get the choice here to say which creator code it should use and which type code it should use for its documents. So that's, you know, as a HyperCard user, you just knew that. It actually let you configure um, uh, your own application and then you see it kind of has this hypercard icon with the hand like most well <laughs> like s some programs at the time apparently had because I'm looking here and mist doesn't have it oh no hex edit has it actually um, see hex edit has a hand here as well anyway and then you can open this color test and it looks basically the same just that you see that there are reduced menus so you don't have fancy um fancy styles and everything all right so we know now um that we can make uh oh and if you look at this with res edit um you see it has all these resources we've seen in hypercard it has picture id4 for instance it has the movie id7 um it has the wtlk resource we saw it has the wdef so it has all these resources that we saw um it has the hand cursor um, so where is our stack? Well, our stack, um, is still in the data fork. Oh, ah, uh, I shot myself in the foot a little bit. So here's the thing. In 68,000 programs, all your code was kept in code resources. In PowerPC source code, your code was kept in the data fork. Um, but if you go to the end of the file, you see tail, new erdet slut. So, um, and you see scripts and on mouse up answer blah 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 you know like you see my script you see bkgd on open card you know you see all these stack so you can tell what um what hypercard actually does when it saves such a standalone is it appends your stack to the end of the source code of hypercard um 
or in the case of a 68,000 only application, which remember MIST actually is because it didn't have the lowercase xcmd, um, what it does actually, it just sticks it in the data fork. So let me just see, yeah, I can do that. That will make it a little faster in the future. So if I drag MIST onto hex edit, you will actually see it just starts with stack and ends with nuerdet slut, missed the application. So now we know. Um, that um, we can actually um, uh, so so we know this is just a hypercard stack saved as a standalone. Tony, interesting. I didn't know you could save stacks as applications. Which hypercard versions support that? I haven't seen that in any hypercard you've tried. One zero two zero and two two. I think I'm I'm not one hundred percent sure. It's either in two two or two three. Uh, no, it must be in two one because that's what mist uses so yeah it's into one it depends on certain files being present so if you look here you see it has stack translators and if you open that you see this one stack to app and so that came with hypercard that's not a third party feature um, but basically they had plugins where you could say, do something with a stack. Um, and so if you maybe didn't install the stack translators when you installed HyperCard at the start, or, you know, like just took your old floppy and the first one was just HyperCard itself on the home stack, which is kind of the minimal combination that you need, um, then it could be that you're missing them. Um, and also there were a few features added, like, um, let's get rid of that again. But um, what you can also do if you save a copy is you can say custom file type. And if you click that, then you see you can here, instead of STAK, which is the type for a file, I could give it a different type, say M-Y-A-G. And so that's basically what they did for MIST, is they um, saved a MIST standalone. And if you see this, there is a space at the start of MIST here. Um, why is that? Because um, this age is called mist. And so if in your code um, you wanted to refer to go to stack mist to go to this age, you couldn't have the home stack, uh, the, this standalone, be named mist as well. So that's why they just snuck a space in there. That explains it. You don't think you have the stack translator installed. Yeah, that's possible. Um, I think it's an, you can untick it in the installer or something. And also, of course, depending on the state of your floppies. <laughs> I, I remember, like, I have lots of floppies where I just put a sec second copy of HyperCard on it or something. There's a bug in the stack. What? Did you... Are you talking about... Um, where is it? Um, come on. We saw it earlier. Yeah, this bug. Or a different one. <laughs> um, 
Anyway, so um, we know now that Mist is actually one, a hypercard stack. Two, um, this space Mist stack is a hypercard stack saved as a standalone, whereas all the different ages are apparently separate stacks um, that are just saved with a custom file type and creator code, so they're associated with Mist. Um, and that's also how th they can get their own icons. Um, also, do I have a save game? I had a save game somewhere. Uh, um, maybe here. Yeah, okay. Um, I've already edited this, but so you can just believe me that save games are actually also just myag missed files. So they're also just a save game. It's funny how some old debuggers used a can of bug spray as the debugger application icon. <laughs> yeah. Um, so anyway, so that in turn means I could go through and change this one from an application into a stack. Um, so stak, which is what Hypercard usually uses, and the creator to wild, which is also what Hypercard uses. Um, I'm not going to do that, I'm not going to save that, but that's what I could do with this here. I mean, I can't do it here because this is on a CD, so I can't write to the CD. Um, at least I hope I can't write to the CD. Um, because this is after all an emulator, it might just go, oh, it's a hard disk. Um, similarly, I can make all the ages into stacks. And if you look in Mist Graphics, you will actually find um, there are a lot of files that end in move or mov. And if you look at those with ResEdit, you can actually see that they have a move resource in it. Move MVHD. Um, um, what is it? Track. So um, it was very common to use these almost readable four character codes back then for, you know, indicating different starts of things. But so uh, someone who is a little familiar with classic Mac OS, um, if you've ever opened a QuickTime movie, for example, here, this Making Mist movie that actually comes with it, um, you'll see that it has a move resource. And that's where the actual movie is. If you look at a QuickTime movie or an MPEG-4 movie today, which is, you know, .mp4, .m4v, or .mov, um, they're basically the contents of this resource written into a file's data fork these days. So that's how old that file format is. Fun thing, if you change the type creator in ResEdit, Finder won't recognize and change and show new icon unless you also untick the initialized checkbox and close and reopen the window containing the modified file. Finder uses that flag to keep track which files have been added to the desktop database. Yes, exactly. Um, so what we're talking about is here, get info. Um, so there are different attributes and one of them is initted. Um, 
And that means to the finder, to this file explorer application on the Mac, um, it means, um, hey, um, you've already seen this. So it actually modified each file uh, to remember whether it had entered its icons into its database so it could show the right icons for the right kind of files. That's also what this has BNDL is for. That basically indicates, okay, this file, which is a little weird that it's set on the Making Mist movie. I think that's a, a mistake. Maybe some bit got flipped in the decades, I don't know. Um, but so uh, this means hmm, this file defines icons for other files so you need to scan it otherwise it could just skip it um, of course you can make a file invisible with that um, alias is like a, a link or symbolic link so not like an internet link but like on your hard disk a file that doesn't actually contain anything but just points to another file and says uh, that file over there, if I'm opened, actually open that other file. Um, yeah, uh, things like that is attributes you can set here. Use custom icon is also interesting, but I think we should stick to mist right now. So I'm not going to go too much into that. Well, this movie also has a preview image, which is very uninteresting, apparently. And it has this PNOT, which I think is also something that you see in in modern QuickTime movies, I think, but I might be wrong. Anyway, so so we can recognize, okay, these files contain move resources, like a QuickTime movie. But if we do get, get info, it has the creator code mist and the type my, but then not ag like age, but rather qt like QuickTime. So okay, they just define their own type for QuickTime movies. And so that actually gives us a pretty good roadmap on how we can start editing. So so here's the thing, um, a hypercard standalone is not actually built with a full copy of HyperCard in it, but rather it's built from the HyperCard player, which was a version of HyperCard um, that didn't come with all the example stacks, but also contained a whole lot of fun, uh, uh, a whole lot of restrictions. One of the restrictions was that um, you couldn't permanently change tools. So, quick intro for those who've never used HyperCard. This is how HyperCard comes up uh, when you start it the first time, basically. Um, and it has a little tools menu, which is a little palette of things that you can use. And then you can switch to, for example, the button tool and move around Uh, okay, undo doesn't undo. Too bad. Um, anyway, um, you can edit, like, buttons, or you can edit fields, or you can use drawing tools, um, to paint everywhere. Um, you know, so all that stuff is there. And so the thing is, usually as a user, you use this hand tool. And you see all these icons are in that font that I showed you earlier. Um, and so HyperCard Player is basically a copy of HyperCard that needs to be able to do most of the things HyperCard does. But it always switches your tool back to the hand tool. And it does not contain a script editor. So if you look at this button... Uh, wait, uh, the official way would be click it once and then say button info. 
and then you see all the properties of the button. You can make it, you know, like have a different border um, and you can edit its script. And its script is just like a little text editor that uh, here sets cursor to watch for the slower machine and help. So these are dash dash means these are commentaries in HyperTalk. So HyperCard scripts are actually fairly easy to read. You can just say on mouse up and mouse up. And so mouse up is, you know, mouse down is you move the cursor over an object and hold down the mouse button. Mouse up is releasing the mouse button again after it has been down. So that's usually when most buttons trigger. That's actually a... Um, a usability feature that, uh, whoops, misclick. Um, let's make a new button and make it auto highlight. So, um, if you go to a button and hold the mouse button on it, don't release it yet, and then move out of it, it undoes the highlight. And so that's basically a kind of undo. If you click and as you have started clicking, you suddenly realize, wait, this is the wrong button. You can pull out again and release the button and nothing happens. Um, maybe we should make this button, make it happen, make something happen. Let's say play a sound. All right. So now if I click it, and release inside. How are you today? It plays a sound. How are you today? But if I move out and release, nothing happens. Um, so that's actually um, what... Um, why did I talk about this? Yeah, this is why it's called on mouse up and why, why we don't just trigger buttons on mouse down like I can always just move the mouse out again and nothing happens um, all right um, so that's basically how hypercard looks and the hypercard player is kind of reduced in a way that it has all these tools but generally jumps back to the browse tool and doesn't let you edit stuff as easily and doesn't have a script editor because that, you know, isn't needed in most standalones. Um, and if you want to, you know, you they, they don't want you selling a full copy of HyperCard by just saving to a standalone and saying, hey, it's a standalone, now I, now I can claim I have the right to use it, you know. Um, so that's kind of the idea. But the way HyperCart was built, it was really too flexible to just turn off things like you would usually do with a player application. Like you can't just say you cannot edit anything anymore because basically every time you do something in HyperCart, it saves it to disk immediately. And it would just be gone. Um... I mean, that's not quite true. You can run HyperCard stacks from a CD and they will just keep stuff in RAM. Um, but, you know, it's it's just different. Um, anyway, so we have these missed files that are stacks that are ages. We have these missed graphics that some of which are QuickTime movies, which are custom file type and creator. So just that you can double click them to open. And we have these files. And what are these? Um, and if, if you look at them, they're actually also hypercard stacks, AG like age. Um, they don't contain anything if you, um, but what they do is they have pictures in them. Um, and so these are additional image resources that were just separated out.
by the makers of Mist. Um, apparently. But they also used stacks for those, for some reason. And we will see... We, we can kind of uh, make sense of this if we know features HyperCard had.